Next up, we'd like to introduce Rabbi Daniel Sharat, who's a new addition to our staff here at OU Kosher. Um, we've only had the privilege of, you know, actually meeting with him face to face about the, a day or two until everything closed down in the city and everyone was sent scrambling back to their homes to, in safe uh, quarters. But uh, Rabbi Sharat actually comes to us with ex extensive cashless experience, both at the Chaf K and the RCBC in Bergen County and the PCK in Passaic. So for those of you that are from Passaic or, um, or from Bergen County, you may have, you know, run into him in other places. He also has operated a kosher vegetable company and has expertise in the line. He also holds a degree in mechanical engineering from Notre Dame University and learned in Tila Shalom in Yerushalayim and Tarvadas with Rebelski Zatzal. So Rabbi, Rabbi Sharat will be sharing both two screens, so make sure you're able to view both of them. Um, Rabbi Sharat, if you want, I can spotlight one of them uh, when you're trying to look at the, some of the uh, creepy crawly things, but otherwise, take it away. So um, Rabbi El, if um, on my queue, I guess uh, you could spotlight my phone, but for now, we'll give it a little like demo. Um, first off, uh, would like to thank Rabbi Elif for working very hard uh, making this happen in unprecedented times. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I, I don't know um, whose idea it was to um, have a bug this have a bug show during or right before lunch, but <laughs> we'll uh, see what we can do about that. So first off. Um, when it comes to uh, the modern day kosher kitchen at home for consumers, um, probably, arguably the most dangerous kosherous part of the modern day kosher kitchen is not Basa Bechalov. All the chickens and meats we're getting um, are, you know, kosher certified and okay, we may have a question here or there of some, some milk drops in the cholent. Worst care, we're using an Eina Binyama pot um, for a meat dish. Invariably, more often than not, even worst case scenarios, these are typically uh, Isuri de Rabbana. Whereas when you're bringing in fresh vegetables to your kitchen, they can be infested with many, many shratzim. And as we know, um, every law, every sharetz can potentially between, be between four to six lavim. And if not done properly or cautiously, um, it could be a very dangerous situation very quickly. Um, I do want to mention, um, it, is in the, it, it is in the attachments that Rabbi Ella sent out to the Ilum, that the Gemara in Baba Metzia, Daf Samech Aleph on the Beis, has a question regarding why by Yitzis Mitzrayim was it mentioned, um, you know, by uh, Kirbe Dagim, or fake Techelis, because a Kodesh Baruch Hu says, you know, I, uh, I'm the one who's Madchen between a Mitzri and a, and a Bechor in Klai Yisrael, and I'm also Mevchin, and I'm gonna pay back for those who've cheated um, and swindled um, fellow Yidin. Now, the Gemara has a following question. So then why does it say Yitzis Mitzrayim by, by Shratzim? So the Gemara says, because, you know, even the question is because these, you don't really make any money by that. By the other fake weights, here we dug in, it's much more expensive, and the guy can make a can make a lot of money by by uh, falsifying that. Whereas by shratzim, there's really no monetary gain. So, what? Why is this mentioned by shratzim? And the Gemara says Rishmel, that it would only if Klai Yisrael would only be nizer in not eating shratzim. The Gemara says it would have sufficed to redeem Klai Yisrael from Mitz Mitzrayim just for that. Um, so it's a very very chashiv. Um, uh, Mixaya that uh, people should be aware of. And uh, so with that, Shkaya for listening. So <clears throat> there are a number of questions when it comes to um, produce when you're bringing it into your home. First off, not everything has bugs. For example, apples, bananas. There's no obligation to be concerned um, that maybe there's the proverbial worm in the apple and we have to check the apple before we eat it. No, because it's very uncommon. And Chazal, we're not concerned that you may come to, you know, eat a worm and an apple. So that would be what's called miyat she'enoit matzu. Something which is uncommon, a minority of the time, but it's such a, min it's such a minority that it's extremely uncommon that doesn't usually not take, take place. So that's one category. Then we move to another category, which is called miyat ha which means that 
majority of the time that this pro this particular produce does not have bugs in it. That being said, you know, we go so Minotauro, we go Besser Reif. So majority of the time it's plain. However, it's common enough that Chazal said you should quote unquote do Abadika. Um, meaning that you have to be concerned of the presence of Shratzim and deal accordingly with that, which we'll discuss soon. <clears throat> so the Mishkanus Yaakov brings a raya um, from a Gemara that uh, if you have 100 barrels of wine, you should check 10 barrels, or the, uh, 10 barrels are uh, considered to be Nisrach, uh, or turn it to vinegar, then you have to check. So Mishkanus Yaakov determines from that that we go of uh, 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 a percentage of 10%. All this, by the way, um, of today's uh, discussion is a very nice synopsis, Rashimus of Rebelski and Dafa Kachers, that is also attached with uh, additional Maimar um, for those who are interested in looking more into it. <clears throat> so we have two categories, then we have a category which the Rabbanan obligated a concern of the presence of insects, and as a result, we Pashtas have to do Abadika. Now, but majority of the time, it does not have any presence of insects. Then we have a third category, which is majority of the time it is infested and you have to check. And if you don't check and you just eat it blindly, that is an Isser Taira. <clears throat> so we have these three categories. <clears throat> and where do we learn this obligation that by a minority, uh, we have to be concerned for? Well. There's a famous Chubas Arashba that we learn it from the Dikas Araya by, by Trephus. Majority of the animals in the world are kosher. Nonetheless, we have the obligation to check the lungs to make sure there are no, no sirchas or lesions. So as a result, um, there's a chiyam midarabonan just like that. Nafkamina, um, there are many nafkaminas by learning like that, um, if that's the makor, because um, one example is if a wolf, for example, steals the lungs away or steals something else, and it was not Peshe, there's no Peshia involved. So, okay, but yeah, but it's fine. That is going to be very important, especially if Rabbanim are going to get getting various questions that it has to be, one has to be cognizant of the Makor um, for the Chiyav of a Badika. Now, <clears throat> so <clears throat> as a result, let's, let's, let's have some fun here. So I'm going to take an item which is uh, you know, of these three categories. Um, and I don't know which category it is. Is it majority of the time infested? Is it minority of the time infested? I don't know. Well, at what point do I start the clock? Meaning at what point do I determine at what level it is? When I pick it up from the ground, from the field full of dirt and flies? Or is it, no, after the normal preparation of things, um, do I, uh, at that point, once I'm done with the normal preparation, at that point, do I shots up? Is it, is it Mia Tamatsi or a, uh, or a Muxik Batalai? So, Rebelski, and there's an OU document, um, six, C67, which is attached, that discusses this point. So, contrary to um, what others may think, um, well, you have to determine it immediately when you pick it up off the ground. This majority of the time is infested. Well, so, and as a result of that, I, there's a chiv bedika now on that particular item. Very important lushan. Again, there's a chiv bedika on that particular item. Pay attention to that lushan. So, <clears throat> Rebelski um, has, a, has, a, has addressed this um, and many other place game as well, that that's not entirely accurate. Um, one of the things being is because, um, when you, uh, sorry, my, my child. <laughs> um, when you um, determine, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, one of the things is because, no, we usually go at the normal preparation of things. So when a person takes a head of romaine lettuce from the field where it has the soil and dirt, they didn't put it on a plate and eat it like that. So Rebelski, as, well, as this is OU policy, as well as, as, well as many other place game, 
the shots up after the normal process of washing it and so on and so forth um, has been taken place. So as a result, this has tremendous naftaminas as when we determine something to be muxik betalaim versus just mia tamatsi. Um, in addition, <clears throat> what does the chiyav bedika exactly mean? Meaning I check a leaf of romaine lettuce and I say, yeah, you know what? There's a bug there. Okay, I did my chiyav bedika crunch. No, but obviously the chiyav bedika when it comes to vegetables is to remove insects because we can't eat them. It's very simple. And there are many possibilities on how to do that. One example is if I have an effective method that's been proven to remove uh, the, the toilayim, then I have essentially done my bedika in that particular way. And at the OU, we have many companies throughout the world where we have to verify um, all methods of washing and the procedures in place as a verification of that. And that is essentially the same as checking a leaf. <clears throat> so <clears throat> in addition, um, <clears throat> The, uh, the, the, the Lushan that I said earlier, that there's a Chiyav Bedika on this particular thing, at this particular leaf, that's not entirely accurate. The Chiyav Bedika is on me. I have to make sure that there are no bugs here. Not that there's a Gzair Sakasiv that I have to have a kosher eyes on this particular leaf. Let's say when you have something like uh, Chalad Yisrael, where Lush is you have to have a Yid be present watching the milk, right? That's not entirely accurate. That's not the case when it comes to a chiyav bedita. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, so when it comes to uh, the chiyav bedita, Shochan Aruch and Simon Pei Dalit Siv Ches, and particularly the Ramah, writes that when you have a, an item which is a chiyav miyatamatsi bedita midirabanan. So, question is, well, can I just do a sampling? I'll just check a sample and I'll make a chazaka and you know, we'll do all that stuff. Now, um, we're gonna discuss, uh, there is gonna be homework for the island, those are interested, why Lamaisa, many agencies, including the OU, do implement on particular instances, chazaka checking. So for that, um, there's a there's a tuftam bedas, chelik alaf sin and kuchav gimel, um, that really di that discusses this that is also mentioned in the Rishimas that is attached. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> and the Ramah writes that something which is a niyatamatsui, it doesn't help to check majority. You have to check all of it. Meaning, I, if I check 90%, that 10% left over, can I just assume it's okay? The Ramah writes, no. Now, the Shach and Sifkat and Chavches explains why. Remember the Makor of Vichy uh, of Bidika from Araya, from checking Trephus in, in, in an animal. So, can a person check six out of the seven lungs and say it's okay? For those that are not aware, uh, a Behema does be, typically have seven to eight lungs, depending on how you count the Inuna Divarda. But, um, do, if I check majority of those lungs, but not all of them, can I say it's okay? Absolutely not. So if the makor for chi of checking is that, so it should be the same exact cheshman. No, I can't check six out of seven heads of lettuce and assume the seventh one is okay. <clears throat> um, because we're learning it from the B'dikas Araya. Now, um, I, wanted to, I do want to mention a very chash of ha'ara here, that the reason why um, by, we cannot assume six out of the seven lungs are okay is because pashtis, there are different variables involved with every particular link, lung, meaning where it's situated. Is it by the back? Is it by the front? Is it by the rib cage? If I see something by the rib cage, then that could, if I bruise by the rib cage, and that, that would help me determine, okay, I got, a, I got a big problem now by the lung that's right by that rib cage. There's a separate discussion and different variables with regard to every single lung. Now, as a result of that, one could argue that that is in fact the same uh, procedure when it comes to vegetables, meaning there are different parts of the field and you could have 
one part of the field that's by power lines and crop dusters that come in, obviously are not gonna do a, a good enough job crop dusting that particular area because they're afraid of the power lines or you have by the roads or this and that. But interestingly to note, which again, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll make a remiss to, to Tutan Vadas, that when it comes to certain situations where variables are the same, such as let's say a greenhouse, for example, we have many companies that do sample checking to verify one, aside from the pr uh, process of washing, in addition, the variables are the same. So the two Tom the Dots writes that when you establish a chazaka like that, even the Rashba would agree to that, which is a very interesting chiddish. And again, you know, there could be a point of distinction just based on the number of variables that are involved. <clears throat> so another thing is we need to, uh, that, uh, to discuss is today's Metzias. You know, I, I get Shilas all the time um, from people who are a little bit um, apprehensive how the fact that, you know, everything has bugs nowadays, Rabbi. I think you have bugs in your glasses. You know, I remember my parents and grandparents, they never did this stuff. And in Europe, what did they do? They did all these crazy things that we're doing nowadays. So there are quite a number of uh, um, explanations for that. So first off, um, the Aruch HaShulchan brings from the Chai Adam, very interesting Metzius. He writes in uh, Sifkat and Samech Aleph, I believe, I'm just, I don't have the Marmachobos in front of me, um, that the Chai Adam says, you know, we got an interesting thing because we can have produce in one locality where you have produce A and produce B that are utterly infested. And over there in that shtetl, nobody eats it. But by us, in our locality, we know that they're totally clean. So by us, we can eat it. By them, they can't eat it. And he writes, and regarding produce C and D, or what have you, it's the exact opposite. So you find very interesting that many of the places in the Taz, the famous Taz regarding Shavuos, where the, they found milk, they found mites or milbin in, in the Kemach, right before Arab Yomtev and had to throw out all the chalas right before Yom Tov. Um, to answer that, that these bugs didn't really exist and never really concerned a problem for Kleisel in the past is simply inaccurate. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> now, when attached to the famous um, Igris, from Ramo, Igris Moshe from Ramosha's itself, um, it's in Chelek Beza Yardea, um, Simon Chavhe. Now there he writes, whether someone had a Shiloh. You know, in Europe, he know, he'd always find the cabbage just utterly infested. And, you know, okay, but since being in America, for the past who knows how many years, he's checking cabbage and he's not finding anything. And as Shiloh Teramisha was, does he still have a Chiyavidika to check nowadays? <clears throat> so Ramisha writes something which, uh, which, which is very interesting. He say he points out that this cheshbin that this man is making is not necessarily tully in the mitzias in and itself. It's not necessarily tully in just the teva of things. The teva of things is that this cabbage is does have bugs, but in this particular case in the United States, or, that it's tully on the farmer that is taking care of his crop. It's a Roy Tully Bamaisa Adam, Ramosha writes. So he said, he writes, listen, if someone wanted to be maple regarding cabbage, now keep in mind this was in, I believe, in 1969 or 1970, uh, six months after this chuba was written, the federal government banned DDT um, due to the uh, popular book at the time called Silent Spring. So the DDT was extremely effective um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of insect pest management when it comes to crops or pest management. <clears throat> so um, as a result, and so he, Ramosha writes then that even though, you know, he hears that uh, one may could be mekel, he one should still check. Now I do want to point out that what Ramosha says that is totally in the farm is as true then as it is true today. Um, for example, there are many farms large farms, we're talking thousands of acres, um, um, where they have whole pest management teams 
dedicated with the chess match of combating and mitigating crop infestation. <clears throat> now, the reason is obvious because there was recently an article done where um, a number of cut consumers, um, they, or they were in Disneyland and they ordered uh, hamburgers and they opened it up and the romaine lettuce um, that was in the hamburger was infested with, pro with, with aphids. Um, and they, they had a lawsuit. So as a result, there, there's a lot of uh, involvement where they at the very least want to mitigate. Now it's not good enough for our standards, but it is worth mentioning. So <clears throat> now when it comes to methods of checking, like I discussed, there's washing and there's the classic checking leaf by leaf on a light box. Now, <clears throat> just like we mentioned earlier, um, there is no real chiv to uh, of a chaloyis ru'iya on every single leaf. It's really on the chiv to me to make sure that there are no vet, there are no insects here. So the, there's a, there's another method of checking that's done in uh, OU establishments as well as many other localities where what's called the shmata vadika. Now essentially, I'm go we're going to walk through the process today. But essentially, what that is is it's a different method. It's more effective and more efficient, um, and as we'll see where we could actually time checking one leaf by leaf versus doing a shmata, and it's incredible to see how much time it actually saves. Um, okay, so now we're gonna get we're gonna get going over here. Let me see. Uh... Okay, good. So <clears throat> what we have here is uh, roaming lettuce. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through various steps that are typical for a consumer for romaine. Romaine, since it's being one of the most popular uh, consumer items, this is one of the reasons why we're just gonna go through that. So obviously, first step is to soap the produce. Um, Rabbi, um, um, Rabbi Elif, if you could uh, zoom in, if you could highlight my phone for a moment, I'd appreciate it. Rabbi Elif? Okay, whatever. So basically what you want to do is you want to soap. Um, you want to put the water in a soap like this and you notice how loose it is. I've been in many places where you will have people literally with this amount of water have an overflow of romaine and as long as one teep of water touches it, oh, okay, I did my washing a bit good. No, 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 no. It has to be loose in the water and it has to be soapy. Now, what you do is when you let it soak, agitate it, move it around and let it get nice and soapy. After that's done, you let it sit for a couple minutes. The next step would be when you're gonna take the leaf of romaine lettuce, what you wanna do is obviously look at all the soap on it, right? So what you wanna do is hold the leaf upside down because these ridges, notice the flow. If you hold it upright, the water is just going to go over it. Whereas if you hold it upside down, the water is going to flow much better through there and it makes it much more effective washing. Now over here, we have a little curveball. These, notice over here, the folds of the romaine lettuce. You see that? So when you're rinsing it over, you want to open up those folds and again, just put some water through there. Great. Your washing is now complete. Now, I'm just going to explain the method of checking um, over here. So what you will do then is after you've done this, you're going to put it, let's say, in a basin like so. Of plain water. Wait a second. Plain water like this. You see, it's just plain water. I'm going to agitate it. Now, what I want to do is once I agitate it, I want to take the leaves out of the water. This is important because, as we'll see in a moment, when I pour the water, I don't want to have it blocked by, um, by a whole thing of, uh, of leaves. Okay? So see how I'm taking it out carefully? Now, once I've done that, we're going to now go ahead and do our shmata vidika. Now what that is, is over here, 
we have what's called a nylon thrift mesh. Now, essentially what it's gonna, it's gonna filter the water. So instead of checking the water, which some places do like this, you know, there are many levels and gradients within this body of water. And essentially what I can do is I can just kind of compress that onto one simple layer to check. So <clears throat> checking the water is essential, is a, is a, is a, is a um, effective measure to help me determine is my washing procedure done? Because invariably when you're rinsing things off, bugs come off. Now, what we're gonna do is notice how there are two strainers here. The reason why there are two strainers is because any large leaf matter will get caught in the top strainer. And, <clears throat> um, okay, Rabbi Elif said uh, he's gonna try to get back on. Hold on a second, but anyways. Um, the, two, the second strainer is going to block any heavy leaf material from blocking my view of the quote unquote shmata, as we like to call it. It's known in the industry as a shmata vidika. And what we're going to do here is very simple. We're just going to pour the water through the shmata. Now, we're going to go over here. And we're gonna check bugs. Now, um, Rabbi, when Rabbi Elif comes back on, um, to please just uh, highlight my phone. In the event that he does not, I request the island to kind of focus on Rabbi Sherat's phone. That's me, okay. <laughs> so now we have our shmata. This is just water to make it nice. Now we are gonna start to delve into um, a very, very interesting topic of discussion. If you look online, there are an incredible amount of sources of procedures on how to check and attached is OU policy in terms of how to attack every single individual type of, of uh, produce that, that there is. Um, but what isn't really so, uh, it, it's not, it's very difficult to do online or virtually is to actually show and demonstrate the bugs and their sizes, which are gonna have many nafkaminas as we go on. Trying to keep track of time, okay, good. So, anybody know what this is? It's a dollar bill, right? Now, we're gonna start discussing <clears throat> exactly what type of bug size is. So I request the other to look at my uh, Rabbi Sherrett phone. So if we take a look over here, let me just turn that off for a second. If you take a look over here, you'll notice right here, every dollar bill has it. Series 2009, here's a 10, here's a, a $10 bill, series 2013. So everybody can see this. This is not really a Shiloh. The height of this, the height of one letter, let's say by the S, or by the not, or by the two is one millimeter tall, just to really give. There we go. You see that? Everybody can see that nice and clear. Beautiful. Now, what happens is we're going to start by bugs which are very common, and we're going to go down in size. We're going to go to bugs which everybody agrees is a problem, to more controversial bugs, and last but not least, bugs which many places, if not all, would agree are not a problem, but you get the pleasure of actually seeing them today and comparative in size. So, just like you saw the series 2009 over here, um, I don't know if it's a federal crime to damage a uh, federal property such as a dollar bill, so I may or may not have uh, damaged the dollar bill in this process. So over here, we have in a light box, you know, it works better without the light, a series, 2003 from what seems to be um, a single dollar bill. Now next to it, we have what's called an aphid. Aphids can be green, they could be, um, they could be red, they could be black, they could be translucent. You are what you eat in this world. So if, you, if I had have shots it up, it's, you know, aside from being incredibly large, that's also long, much larger than a one millimeter. This bug, according to everybody, is going to be a problem. Now, when it gets more interesting is even the babies, 
which the place can discuss that, you know, you have little tiny bugs that are green and the same color as the leaf, that postus is uh, referring to aphids. Now, um, at the end, I may or may not, depending on time and if people are eating lunch right now, um, this isn't pregnant and a baby, an aphid can reproduce up to every 20 minutes, a new baby. And if we pop this guy, you're gonna see a whole assembly line of bugs ready to go. But that's, so that's, that's an aphid. Now, just to compare and contrast, we're gonna move on to the next shmata. And these are also very, very common. And this is where majority of these, this is called the threat. Now, majority of these bugs are a problem. But we're gonna show the different life stages and there are a few nafgaminas with regard to their size. Before I forget, let me get that. One second. I uh, want to get that uh, that piece of a dollar. Here we are. Okay. So what I want to point out to here is we have our series 2013 right there, and I want to grab a thrip and show you its size. Let's get a little moist. So it'll go easily on the toothpick. Sorry for the uh, nitty gritty. This is the reason why it's, you know, especially virtually a lot of people don't do this sort of thing. So let's take a look at an adult thrip. It's all, it seems that it's larger than one millimeter, which everybody can clearly see. Now, these are typically going to be this size and color. Now, conversely, I want to show you what a baby looks like. Now, there are many stages of babies. For example, if we have a large baby. This is instar stage two. And I'm going to, once, I'm, once I line them up, I'll put it on the uh, jeweler's loop for a magnification, um, which we're going to discuss as the, bug, the next stage where we're, talking, we're going to discuss smaller bugs and halakhic ramifications on that. And I'm gonna show you a baby, baby, baby. Okay. Now, look at that. So there are a number, the, the life cycle of a thrip is important to know because there's the larvae stage, the crawler stage, instar stage one, instar stage two, until you reach, reach um, the uh, adulthood. Now the adult thrip, as opposed to the babies, um, notice how the abdomen is striped, as well as it has wings. Now, an interesting shyla is, well, we know that shruts and that fly have an extra lot. Now, a thrip does not actually use its wings to fly. What it does, it just uses its wings as a parachute. If it wants to uh, go somewhere else, it'll jump and catch a breeze and use its wings to transport. So technically, they don't fly, but nonetheless, they have the presence of wings. And Klapishmaya, it's interesting exactly how many lava in this particular bug, bug would be. Um, now, we see kind of like a, a buffer uh, right next to it. So that is pretty close to uh, a one millimeter, not quite, but it's still problematic. As Ramosha writes, um, or Ramosha is quoted by many places as at least stating to Rabbi Gissinger as a zone. Now, we're gonna get closer and I apologize for the quality. It's not, it's not really coming through so well on the Zoom, but in the very, on next to it, this little itty bitty guy is a baby, baby thrip. Now he looks about 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 millimeters. That is very, very small. Even with rat magnification, it is difficult to detect to a normal eye. Now, I want to show something, something when we're going to go back to here. Now we're going to discuss size. This obviously is a $10 bill. And we can all clearly read that, series 2013. But I wonder if anybody ever noticed next to it, and there's a, every dollar has its interesting trick like this. Next to it, there is some writing along that line. 
Can anybody read what that says on a $10 bill? It's very hard to ter determine that. So what it says, and even it's very difficult for me, and I'm considered a real big expert, you know, um, the United States of America, $10. And it just repeats itself over and over and over again. So that is approximately 0 0.2 millimeters in size, which at the very least, OU policies, many, many, as well as many places can hold, are not um, near lane nine, not visible to the naked eye easily. Unless the caveat obviously being what if you see the sheriff's crawl, which we might see soon, um, then the troops are then it's obviously us because you know it's a bug. You could obviously detect that it's a bug, otherwise it wouldn't be moving. Fine, but that's a caveat aside. Okay, now. Yeah. We've discussed thrips and aphids, which we have to have a legitimate concern about in our produce. And also, um, I believe attached with regard to the OU guide for checking, will tell you which bugs you have to be concerned about, thrips or aphids or whatnot. Now, <clears throat> we're gonna get into a very controversial bug in Halafa called the spider mite. Now the spider mite, reason why it's controversial is because of its size. Many, many spider mites are not near laying iron, just primarily due to its size. Where did I put that? Uh, all right, whatever. So, <clears throat> whereas, um, whereas let's say you could have some species, now there are thousands of species of every, every type of insect. So there are thousands of species of spider mites. Um, some of them, not all of them, are actually quite large and problematic. But majority of the time, when we're discussing produce and spider mites, majority of the time, they are very, very small. So here I have a schmata of mint. And over here, we are going to have hundreds upon hundreds of spider mites. Now, I just gave you, um, so just like we saw, you see that 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 guy in the middle is a threat. You see those little dots that surround it? Those are spider mites. Now just for fun, what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare it on our $10 bill to actually measure its size. And very likely, it's not going to be noticeable even. You can't even see it. It's smaller than those letters. So here we have a bug, which is not us or al -Pihalaka. This is called the spider mite. Now again, like I said earlier, when it comes to determining, um, when it comes to determine um, the chiv or miyatamatsi, this is this is actually stated in the OU document C76 on how you determine um, the level of uh, miyatamatsi. Even though you could find sometimes, you know, something really infested, but when we determine miyatamatsi, mochsek, or miyatamatsi, we like to take a look at it cumulatively, cumulatively. So majority of the spider mites, which may or may not, which, which are not a problem, even though you would have a me at the species, let's say I think they're called spider mite destroyers, a species of spider mites, which eat other, other mites, um, may be larger, but we are lurk, looking um, globally, um, or at least regionally, as the Chachma Sabin wrote earlier, um, when it comes to the level of infestation. Now, I didn't forget to mention that obviously in the 60s and 70s, and even before then in the 50s, and certainly in the Chacham Sodom's time, in the Archa Shulchan's time, that the global economy that we have today is where I could get produce from any in the world, anywhere in the world on a daily basis. And the fact that you have that ability, um, we, you know, makes things much uh, more difficult and obviously more common in terms of the infestation throughout the world, kind of reaching a similar, uh, a similar uh, thing. Now, I just here we have another very, very, very scary bug. The reason why it's scary is because when it rains, it pours. Not like a thrip or an aphid, where 
you could find one or two or three. Okay, fine, that's it. That's not yish uh, blila balak when it comes to shratzim. The exception to that is called the white fly. Now, in general, it's not a common find, but in many establishments, if typically white flies are found, you know, unless the bala bus is going to want to spend all day long on one or two heads of kale or something along those lines, you know, it's obviously a very good business decision to just not deal with it. Especially um, when you're dealing with your kitchen, it's always Kadai, but if you need one bundle of cilantro, to always buy two because you don't want to become emotionally and physically invested in one bundle that could be infested where it's just an extra 90 cents to have an extra bundle in case. It's always a good, uh, you know, practical decision, not halakhically, practically. Okay, so here is an example of what a real infestation looks like. Um, <clears throat> These are white flies. Now we're going to discuss eggs as well as different larvae stages, and it comes from a very interesting discussion. So, first off, you see all this uh, schmutz over here. See all that schmutz, all that schmutz, not the leaf matter. This is leaf matter. I'm talking about what looks like dirt. That is not dirt. What that is are eggs. All those are eggs from white flies. Um, one white fly female lays between two to 400 eggs in a shot and they're very sticky and it's just an incredible thing. Now, when it comes to eggs, eggs are, uh, when it, first off, these are not near laying iron, just FYI, because of their size. In addition, they're eggs, they're not shratzim. So there's a very interesting discussion regarding uh, shratzim, which is uh, eggs, which I think for now we're just going to go, uh, you know, beyond the scope of this discussion. What I want to point out is, let's see if I can find where he went, <clears throat> is the stages of, um, give me a second here, the stages of uh, this. So what I have here, this is a white fly larvae, that little circle guy over there. Now he gets, get, gets bigger. What happens is once the egg hatches, um, what happened, it becomes a little crawler. It goes somewhere, you know, a little, a little bit farther from where it hatched. And then, and there he is right there. You see, I see him. What happens is they then dig themselves into the leaf and then they flatten and they become almost like an insect scale. Now, in terms of their size, they are actually surprisingly um, big. We're going to put them next to the series. 2013. I'm kind of squished them a little. He's quite significant in size. He's about, uh, I'd say like 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 millimeters. Now the thing is with this guy is he's so embedded and stuck in the leaf, it's very hard to remove him. And I guarantee you that when you find presence of white flies like this, you're going to find more that are actually embedded in the leaf. So <clears throat> that is um, essentially an idea of a topic where you can have bugs which are usher lapulioma, the bugs which become a very interesting machlekes or gray area, because at what point do you draw the line? This is a problem, this isn't. Some pies can determine maybe it's a suffocus or, or whatnot, especially if you want to get a shila like that. Which produce are you talking about? What type of bugs are typically um, involved in? If you get a call Arab Shabbos from a woman saying, oh, she checked her vegetables, but she mixed them in with other vegetables she didn't check. So what should she do? And it's right before Shabbos. Well, one of the questions that um, the Rabbanim have to know is, well, what type of vegetable are you talking about? And to me, that's going to tell me what type of bug am I discussing as well? The level of infestation as well as the size and what was done, so on and so forth. And interestingly to note, even though Badika's Talaim it's slightly different, but again, going back to our Makor, with the Chiv Badika is just like Badika's Haraya, what happens if a wolf were to come and take away the lungs and there was no Pshia involved? Well, but yeah, but it's fine. That's another thing where we have to be aware of, um, aware of these various variables and Makoris when discussing um, Badika's Talaim in the modern day kitchen. So I, with that, I have already um, put in the group chat 
my email address if anybody has any questions or follow-ups. And I guess right now, um, I'll be willing to take any questions. Did those uh, big bugs that were bigger than a one millimeter, did they come out of the romaine lettuce that you washed just there, or those were out of other vegetables? No, that was already prepped. Actually, you know what? Let's have some fun. So what I've done is just make things quicker for the pre purpose of this presentation. Um, I still actually have the romaine lettuce soaking in soap water. I just took one of the three heads that I had and put it in water. Um, if you want to see what infestation looks like, you know, before the washing, we get to kind of take a look right now. Um, here, let's just put this over here. Now, this is just from one head of romaine lettuce. And we're going to have, well, let's go hunting, see if we find any goodies. So I already have, here, could you uh, highlight my uh, phone, Rabbi Ella? Or you, for those that could highlight it. So we already have, it's hard for me to see uh, without, you know. So we already have one right there. That's an adult thrip, like we mentioned earlier, because you can see by the abdomen, as well as the, uh, as well as the, as well, so that's one. We have another one right over here. We got two. We have three, four. Um, I mean, this happened to be a good batch. Uh, the reason why I know it was a good batch is because, and this is a good eights of for uh, anybody that's going shopping is, if you want to go, if you when you're buying romaine, fresh romaine lettuce, which is very delicious, I might add, you're gonna buy a bag. Before you buy it blindly, just take two, just 15 seconds, look around. If you see a bug, don't buy it. Very simple because when you're gonna experience, my personal experience has shown, if you find a bug on the outside, that means there's more inside. Um, it, that, that does not necessarily mean that if you don't find anything in the out that, oh, well, I don't have to do a Chiv No, that's not the case. Um, so over here, we found um, at least six or seven um, threat, adult thrips. I haven't seen any babies yet. Um, so that is just, um, you know, what that's the, you see why it's important to wash your vegetables um, before eating, before consuming them. Okay, next question. When could it's one assume that all the bugs have been washed off? I see that from Doe Fink in the chat. Excellent question. Um, this is obviously, you know, there are many variables when it comes to even your normal kitchen. For example, the water pressure, the size, my thoroughness versus my wife's thoroughness or my kids or who knows what. Um, and as a result of all these variables, you know, one could assume that all bugs have been washed off when they have verified that this particular method has been very effective in removing shrubsen. So as a result, we have many facilities where they do, they process a number of vegetables. And one of the processes of kosher certification is to verify that their washing method has been effective. Now, how to verify, well, it's very simple. Their bugs in the end product or not. You know, it's in the proof is in the pudding. After you've done your method of checking or a method of washing and you've checked for a significant amount of time for a significant amount of seasons, like the Aruch HaShok and the Pri Chadash also write that you cannot assume from one season to the next or even from one year to the next, but we're not gonna, but at the very least, you've been doing this method for quite a number of times and you've never found anything and you know what bugs look like, obviously, then you, at that point, one could assume that essentially their method of washing is effective. Um, two questions I have are one, um, if you're checking like romaine lettuce and you find in one head that there's an infestation of either um, thrips uh, th or aphids or whatnot, or even multiple types, um, at what point um, would there be a halachic requirement to throw it out and to not even check the other ones? Or would there not be? That's question so, number one. The Ramal writes very clearly um, that there's no uh, there's no uh, halacha that you can answer the romaine because the romaine, the vegetable inherently in and itself is kosher. It's just there's a mitigating factor that there's something, a foreign object on there that's preventing me from eating it. So halachically, um, you can never really answer a produce. Um, I mean, that, I, that bundle specifically. I'm sorry. Yeah, even that bundle. That being said, you know, um, OU policy, for example, um, as well, well, uh, many agencies you know, we do have a recommendation that 
after three times of washing it and then checking afters and you still find, throw it out. You're just, you're just gambling, you know, and especially when you're praying, paying a mishgiach to sit there and work on it, that, that costs a lot of money. And, you know, it, it's, it's usually best for everybody involved to just move on to a different, different item. Right. And my, my second question is, thank you. My second question is, if you take, get it by a package of fresh romaine lettuce and you check one head and it's fine, completely like you check with your eye, like looking at it, not doing the you mean, you mean from the outside of the package. No, no, no. You bought it. You brought it home. You checked one of the three heads. Usually there's three and you checked it by looking at it under light properly, not even doing the soap and all that, which is um, fine. You have if to check like the other two. So you want to know regarding the other two? Yeah. So for, if you're only doing three heads, um, the answer is essentially yes. Um, you know, for I think you're gonna have to look at the two of das exactly when chazaka checking would apply. But um, for in a small situation at, at your home, like yourself, um, you would have to follow the Ramah and the Shach that you have to check all three heads. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Um, okay, another question is um, what's the guidance on parsley? So you know, in terms of um, going through every single particular item is beyond the scope of this class um, because there are quite a number of vegetables. Um, so for that, I'm just gonna defer to the OU document. If any specific questions, you can always email me. Um, let me just type in my email address one more time for the OLM. Okay, next question, any other questions? Do any, does anyone say that it's not considered nira? Because if you look at a leaf without like putting it under a light box, like that's not considered nira because I don't see it on a leaf itself. I mean, as so opposed to like it's nira when you look at it under a light box. Yeah. So the consensus of the Piscans camouflage is not really a factor when it comes to determining the, um, the Isser. In addition, there's a Gillian Marshall on the page in Shulchan Aruch, it's in the Paydalid, um, which brings in the Knesset Zagadila, Hagaz Beis Yosef, Knesset Zagadila, Sif Samech I believe, or Samech Gimel, um, that discusses the following situation. You have a guy looking at a bundle of herbs. He's looking, he's looking, he's looking. Rabbi, I don't see anything. So the Knesset Zagadila grabs it from the guy, bangs it, and you see all the bugs start crawling around. And yeah, and obviously, you know, in, in, in a way, what that means is, you know, simple, effective measures to help us determine the presence, which has already told us that there is a presence and the Mitzvah dictates us. So, you know, even though we don't have a chiv to do really crazy ways of uh, checking or destroying certain produce in the process, like really destroying, not just washing it three or four times, that's something different, um, you know, then, then essentially you have to do a certain, you have to do simple things like that, like banging or what have you to determine the presence of insects. And just because you can't see it over here, you know, it doesn't mean it's not there necessarily. And again, you know, again, um, I, you know, when it comes to specifics regarding every certain type of produce, Again, I would just uh, take a look. You can email me or look at the OU chart that, that's attached. <clears throat> okay. Um, any other questions? Are there questions in the chat? Oh, okay. If one is at someone's house and is unsure if they had washed their vegetables properly, Ooh, what should they do? <laughs> um, I'm going to pass on that question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, and it, there's, a, there's a number, quite a number of uh, variables that have to be asked before answering a blanket question like that in general. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, let's see what time is it now. 1228. Uh, Rabbi Aleph, uh, I guess we'll take one more question and then we'll, uh, I guess, uh, Move on. We can take one or even two more questions. Uh, we're going to take a five minute break um, until 1240. Uh, actually, we have like about 10 minutes over here. Um, okay. So, you know, if you want to take more questions, if you want to take a break, we can do both. Okay, I'll take two more questions then. 
what about those bags for soups that they that say they keep in the bugs? Well, you know, it depends if they're kosher certified to verify that fact. But obviously, um, you know, for example, with these, with these, with these shmatas, the whole size, you know, does not allow any bugs to come through. So I guess I'm not really familiar with any particular product you're referring to, but this, my assumption is if it has a co legitimate kosher certification, then one could assume that the holes are going to withhold back any shratzim. Do industrially triple washed lettuce have lower instances in, of infestation? So if we're talking about um, quote unquote triple washed, um, you know, Taylor Farms, or, but they have no certification on it, the answer is absolutely not. They are, can, they can be really infested and the triple wash is essentially nothing. It's just a bunch of mist at times. And, you know, I jokingly say sometimes that the count, if it rains, that's, that's also one of the three washes that it goes through. Um, so one cannot um, just, since it says triple washed, and even if it has a KORC symbol on it, um, one would have a Chiyab Bidika still. I'm just going to jump in over here. Two things. One is that uh, in this form, we don't recommend, we don't take a stance on any other hashgachos. Um, the other thing is someone asked if we have OU publication with the different types of bugs reference. So if you actually uh, take a look, we did give a, a little bit of a cheat sheet, four pages in your source book with different methods for checking and cleaning vegetables. This is actually part of our larger, we sell online, you go to OU Kosher's website, the guide to ch uh, vegetable infest uh, checking vegetables, which will give you more clearly uh, the pictures and descriptions of what needs to be done as well. All right, thank you, Rabbi Yalev. Any other questions? Is anything bugging anyone else? Okay, thank you very much, Rabbi Sharat, um, for the most informative, enlightening, enjoyable, and definitely descriptive presentation. We're going to take a about a 10-minute break now and